Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody at home. Anybody here for the first time tonight? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back, everybody else. Anybody tuning in on Zoom for the first time? Welcome. Um, I got a question for you about um, spice. Not the kind you smoke, but the kind you eat. What, how do you... Uh, how do you like spice, like scale of one to 10? Like how hot do you like it? Don't answer, but just uh, reflecting for a moment on um, how much you like your mouth to burn and, and, and why? Why do you like pain in your mouth, right? Like this, I think this is a really an interesting because, you know, the, the kind of the core of the Buddhist, uh, you know, teaching is that we suffer based on our craving for pleasure and our aversion to pain. But spice, spicy food, really like hot, is an interesting thing because it's actually painful, but you like it. It's a pleasurable pain, right? So the, this kind of, it can't be so, uh, you know, black and white, like, well, pain is always bad. Pain is always something that I want to get rid of. And if we reflect on our relationship to spicy food, and then we can start to reflect on all of the other pains that we like and things that we do that are somewhat unpleasant, but for some reason we take pleasure out of them. Um, even like your relationship to that line between fear and excitement, where it's like, oh, this is kind of terrifying, but it's so fucking fun. Even like the roller coaster or something like that, where it's like, this is fucking terrifying and I like it. Um, anyways, I'm gonna get a little bit more into the, the talk tonight, but just like, uh, your, what's your relationship to spice, to burning your tongue and taking pleasure in it? And of course there's some people who are like, zero, don't give me anything spicy. It's abusive. Don't even put pepper in my shit. And there's other people who are like, I want to eat the ghost peppers. I want to, I want to fucking, I want to burn my tongue and I want to burn my butthole later. Like I really, I want it to hurt on both sides. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Um, and uh, so think about that. How scale of one to 10, are you, a, are you a zero little, little bit of pepper or are you like uh, jalapenos, habaneros, ghost pepper kind of person? And then just, you know, don't judge it, just be honest. So uh, here in the room, turn to some people that you don't know and just introduce yourself and talk about your relationship to spicy food for a moment. And at home, I'm going to throw you into breakout groups. There we go. There you go. So join a breakout group and talk about your relationship to spicy food. Yeah. <laughs> 
Welcome the group folks that are here are in breakout rooms and they'll be back in a moment. Chris, you think of a uh, you think of a font yet? You're you're muted, but you can shoot me a shoot me a, a like a text or something and and. Uh, Kind of I, I think I have one. I um, actually spoke with uh, uh, Russ earlier about uh, doing a, a good riddance uh, font. And, he, and uh, I talked to uh, him and Luke, and they were both really down with it. So that could be cool. I can't. I can't I, quite I, hear you, but we'll talk later. Yeah. yeah. So finding a way to sit over some meditation and don't think about spicy food while you're meditating. Upright, relaxed. Taking a moment as you let your eyes be gently closed to settle into the posture. Making any adjustments that need to be made so that we can come into relative stillness. Part of our practice in sitting meditation is learning to be uncomfortable, to actually allow it to burn when the back gets sore, or your knees start to ache, your ass starts to hurt. Rather than shifting out of it, away from it, breathe into it, allow yourself to be uncomfortable, accept. Discomfort is part of our practice, part of what we need to learn. How to tolerate and ultimately have compassion for our own pain. As you settle into the meditation posture, the chair, the cushion, the couch, your bed at home, wherever you are. Release any unnecessary stuff, any unnecessary tension. Tightness around the brow, the eyes, the jaw. If possible, allow your shoulders to fall away from your ears a bit. Let gravity just... Stop resisting, let your shoulders relax if you can.
Soften your belly as you exhale. So often we hold a tightness, a hardness in our stomach. Let your stomach be soft as much as possible. And establish the intention to be kind to yourself. As you sit here, even if it becomes uncomfortable, to meet the unpleasant experiences of sitting meditation with friendliness. As we choose to sit still for 30 minutes, to develop wisdom and compassion, an attitude of accepting ourselves just as we are. We establish mindfulness in the body, mindfulness of the breath, of the posture, contact with the chair, all the sensations that the body's experiencing right now. Mindfulness is awareness of the present, dropping our attention out of our mind's tendency to think about the future, all of the planning and hoping and worrying the mind likes to do. We're not trying to stop the mind, but just bring the attention, the awareness out of the contents of our thoughts and into the body. Let the thoughts be in the background as you become more and more mindful of the body. One of the things that becomes obvious is the sensations of the breath, the body breathing all by itself. So let the breath be your focus for a few minutes giving your full awareness to the sensations the breath creates. What's it feel like? The Buddha's early instructions were something like breathing in, know that you're breathing in, breathing out, know that you're breathing out. What allows you to know it? Receiving the sensation, feeling the sensation.
of course, our awareness doesn't stay with the breath. We get drawn back into thinking, plans and memories and resentments and cravings, lusting, whatever the mind hooks you with, draws you back into thinking. This is one of the keys to mindfulness. You start to learn that you can choose to not pay attention to your mind. Bring your attention back, gently reconnecting with the breath over and over, even if it's just a half a breath at a time.
If you're brand new to this kind of practice, you can continue to come back to the breath and investigate it. What's the temperature, the texture, the duration of the breath? Is it long or short, deep or shallow? We're not trying to control it, really just receive it, investigate it. The body breathes all by itself. Sometimes when we put our attention on it, it feels like we're controlling it. If that's your experience, it's okay. Those of you who have been practicing for some time, have experience with mindfulness, begin to open your attention to the sense doors. Begin with mindfulness of hearing, just as we investigate the sensations of the breath with our mindfulness, awareness, and that kind of attention to hearing sounds are not a distraction from the present, they're happening right now. Shift the attention to the eyes, seeing what is your experience of seeing behind the closed eyelids. Is there color? Is there light? Shift. 
shapes, designs? What do you see? And again, is it pleasant or unpleasant? Are you aware of wanting to see pleasant things, not wanting to see unpleasant things? Sometimes the mind produces mental images. Are they pleasant or unpleasant or neutral? What's your relationship to the images your mind produces? Shifting the attention to the experience of smell. Feeling the breath entering and exiting. And tuning into any smells. And opening to the mouth and tongue and the taste. Bringing our attention to our own minds. What kind of thoughts are present? What kind of emotions are being born in your mind in this moment? Is the mind fantasizing or planning? 
arguing, remembering, debating. Craving for this moment to be more pleasant than it is. Aversive, resisting, perhaps even angry about what's happening, the discomfort in the body. Our awareness is inclusive in this way, mindfulness of our whole body, heart, mind, sense doors. Awareness of what's happening moment to moment and how it feels, the pleasant, the unpleasant, the neutral.
for the last couple of minutes as you scan your awareness through your body. Does your body crave comfort? Does your body hate pain? What you perceive as painful? Do your ears crave pleasant sounds? Hate unpleasant sounds? your nose, your tongue, craving and aversion. Your mind, your heart, your body. The Buddha, um, anybody that's, I don't know how many people are new to, to Buddhism, but the Buddha was a real person, Siddhartha Gautama, not a god, not a, some sort of deity or something, but just a man who got really passionate and curious about this human condition and why it's so challenging, why we are... Uh, so much suffering is suffering seems to be the norm. Um, and as he discovered mindfulness and, and really started to investigate uh, his own direct experience, he saw, oh, everything's perceived as pleasant and unpleasant and neutral. But we have this instinctual craving, drive uh, to cling to the pleasure, to want it to feel good, and that we don't have much built in tolerance for pain. We have aversion, we have resistance, we have fear of pain. Uh, pain in some way says, I'm going to kill you if, if, I'm, if you're uncomfortable. Even just sitting still for a half hour, you're like, I can't fucking do this. This is uncomfortable. Um, and so he, he saw that, and then he saw that he could, we could, he could, and, and that we all could change our relationship so radically to this human condition of craving and aversion and to the point where we don't have to suffer about it anymore. And he came to uh, what we call nirvana and enlightenment, awakening. And then he spent the rest of his life, 40 years, he spent seven years <clears throat> of intensive meditation training. And um, you know, a couple of things that I thought were really impressive i don't know i don't know if i should bring this up but i'm gonna do it um i don't know how many of you have seen the new dave Chappelle <laughs> controversial um comedy um one of the things that stuck with me he was criticizing some of the current um sort of social justice movements of being a little bit too much kind of um, uh, talking about it, but not being about it. And I want to 
I left $50 million on the table and walked away from Hollywood because it's fucked, you know, in, in some ways. And I just, that just really stuck with me. He said, you know, I'm not just, you know, uh, you know, kind of speaking about these things. He's like, I, you know, I, I did this. I walked away from this toxic thing for a decade or however long it was that he did. So I was thinking about that uh, and the, the kind of the renunciation and the, um, that we're practicing in Buddhism. And I was, and I, you know, not that Chappelle is at all Buddha-like, but um, the Buddha had a similar um, experience when he went to, to learn meditation, he, the first two meditation teachers that he met um, both of them for he first he met this meditation teacher and the, the teacher was like you have mastered this meditation technique and I will give you my community to run with me and I'll give you the prestige and I'll give you the you know I'll give you the keys to the meditation center like just you know you're a really good meditator <laughs> and and the Buddha said no I, I'm not going to be seduced by power I'm looking for liberation. I'm looking for freedom. And your meditation technique does not take us all the way to liberation. Your meditation technique gets us very concentrated. So we temporarily experience bliss, but then the concentration wears off and the suffering returns. And he's like, I'm looking for something that's not a temporary meditative phenomena, but that is something I can live, something that humans can live into. And then another meditation teacher, and this is like early, um, what we would call Hinduism, what uh, originally was called uh, kind of Brahmanism. And, um, and then the next meditation teacher also said like, yeah, you got this, like you, have had the highest experience that I can teach you. And well, here's the keys. <laughs> here's the, you know, like run this community with me. We'll be rich and famous. We'll be gurus. It'll be awesome. And the Buddha was like, no, I, I'm going to leave that on the table because it's not, I'm looking for liberation. What you're teaching me is avoidance. I'm not looking for avoidance. I don't want to temporarily avoid my, mind, I want to change my relationship to my mind. And then went off and did his own asceticism practice for a long time and then discovered mindfulness, what we're doing. The Buddha created mindfulness. You know, at this point in, in America, in the West, mindfulness has become such a buzzword and, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based psychotherapy and mindful, you know, all of these things. And they've tried so hard to divorce it from as though it's like something that psychologists created. Uh, there's, there's no historical anywhere in any other religion in anything before Siddhartha came along, he discovered mindfulness. He created mindfulness. He, and it's, it's a Buddhist meditation technique that the Westerners psychologists have borrowed. And it's great. I'm not, I don't want to dis secular mindfulness that much. It's so cool. There's millions of people meditating that wouldn't be meditating. Uh, all of those, I mean, there's maybe some ethical issues with monetizing it the way that people have, sort of stealing something from Buddhism and saying like, let's make apps. The Americans will give us $5 a month. You know, let's, let's make millions off of the Buddha's freely offered meditation technique. So there's some ethical issues with the way that it's being... Um, disseminated in our culture, but setting that discernment aside, so I almost said judgment, but it's not even a judgment, it's, it's a wisdom, discernment. Um, so the Buddha comes to his awakening and he uh, first teaches the Four Noble Truths, and it's the core of what we, it's the core of what we, what I talk about most of the time, Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. The cause is repetitive craving. And it's part of what I was directing us to in the meditation tonight. Can you feel that repetitive craving as you sit here? And <laughs> something unpleasant happens and the, the craving for it to go away or something pleasant, your mind is like, I wish this felt better than it does or I was more comfortable than I am or um, 
repetitive craving, just a little bit of mindfulness shows you that's true. That's how we're wired with this constant, I want to feel better than I do, different than I do, more comfortable than I do, happier than I am, uh, you know, sexier, whatever it is. I want to feel better, different, more pleasant. And that, uh, you know, there's suffering, there's a cause, and that it's possible to end suffering. That was his core. He said, I've done it. I know from direct experience that I changed my relationship to my mind, to my body, to this self-centered human condition. He said, I'm not suffering anymore. Now I meet pain with compassion. Now I meet pleasure with non-attached appreciation. Now I understand that this mind is not who I am. This body is not who I am. Even this consciousness is not my identity. It's all just a natural process unfolding. And he went and he, he taught the, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the path of ethics and meditation and wisdom. And it was, there was like five people, five Buddhists in the world. 2,600 years ago, There's, he told his friends and they understood it. And then some young, um, some young uh, uh, sons of local merchants, the merchant class, uh, ran into him and he explained to them the, the truth of impermanence and the suffering that, that, cr- that clinging and craving causes. And they were like, okay. And then, so the, the kind of second, I don't know how many, let's say, you know, a dozen or, you know, again, just a few of his students were these kind of like middle-class kids. And then after, and this is all around Varanasi, it's in a place called Saranath, uh, kind of Northern, Northern India just outside of Varanasi. And then he left Varanasi and he went back to Bodh Gaya, the place where he had become enlightened, where he woke up. And when he got back down there, he ran into um, these Hindus. uh, um, They were called fire worshipers. um, um, And he gives this talk, it's called the fire sermon. Now the context of the fire sermon and these fire worshipers is that these, these two brothers and what they were described in the scriptures as is uh, matted hair ascetics and who were doing ritualized uh, you know, fires where they're doing um, offerings to the fires. They were worshiping the fire. They were perhaps meditating on watching the kind of flames and the impermanence and doing the traditional Hindu, Brahmanic, um, probably, what's it called? Like, um, uh, what's it called when you kill animals to sacri- uh, sacrifices? And it's a, it's a very tra- traditional Indian thing back then. And, and to you know, sacrifice the goat or whatever it is to the gods. And so there were these kind of huge bonfires, sacrificing the animals, worshiping the fire, worshiping probably Shiva is the kind of god of destruction of fire. Now, something that doesn't say this, but I'm going to add this. You know, I don't know how many of you have been to India or, or are familiar with Indian uh, spiritual traditions other than Buddhism, but the dreadlock, matted hair means dreadlocks, the, the dreadlocked um, Hindus are mostly Shiva worshipers, but not all. Some of them are uh, Vishnu, Vaishnavas. And uh, their meditation practice isn't just watching the fire, it's smoking weed. They're, they're like, you know, Indian Rastas. And they just, they just smoke weed and their meditation is just like, get fucking stoned and watch the fire and then, you know, have a barbecue with the sacrificed <laughs> lambs or whatever. So the Buddha, and there's these two brothers, and they both have thousands of followers. They're like the biggest, you know, they got the best weed, and they have the biggest bonfires, and they're like the most popular ascetics, you know, kind of fire worshipers. And he, and he comes into contact with them. And then, you know, the, the traditional story gets a little mystical, and there's this, like, battle that happens of, like, who's got the best kung fu spiritual, you know, like who can do miracles, who can, you know, 
And at some point, you know, I, my own sense of the, the way that it's traditionally told is that it's a bunch of religious exaggeration um, of a kind of, you know, debate that they're having about their teachings and their practices. And, and uh, you know, the Buddha basically just says point blank to this guy and all of his followers, you're not a liberated being, you're stuck. You know, you're not enlightened. He, he says, I, I found it, I, you know, and you don't have it, but I can teach you it. You know, worshiping the fire is never going to lead you to liberation. Smoking weed is never going to lead you to liberation. Killing animals is never going to lead you to liberation. If you really want to be free from suffering, if you're looking for what I was looking for, what you're doing is a dead end. You know, and just imagine like going into like, I don't know what is our current equivalent, but like Burning Man. Imagine showing up to Burning Man and starting to lecture, you know, the folks about like the dead end that they're on with their drugs and art and, you know, nakedness. Never going to bring happiness to you. But would you like to learn mindfulness? Um, And so the, the leader listens and the Dharma talk that the Buddha gives, he says, okay, and this is one of the things that's beautiful about the Buddha, I think, is that he'll really speak the language of the people that he's talking to. And so he says, okay, okay these are fire worshipers. Let me frame this around fire. They understand fire. And so he says to them, you're looking for freedom, but you're looking for it through eyes that are burning. Your eyes are burning with greed for pleasant sights. Your eyes are burning with hatred of unpleasant sights. Your eyes are burning with the self-centered delusion of identification with what you're seeing. Your ears are burning with greed, hatred, delusion. Your tongue is burning with greed, craving for pleasant tastes, aversion to unpleasant tastes. Like the example of, uh, I asked you in the beginning, what's your relationship to spicy food? And this perspective that whether you like spicy food or you don't like spicy food or a little bit's okay or whatever, this teaching that says, no matter what, your tongue is burning. Whether it's burning with aversion Two, you, you find jalapenos unpleasant and you hate them and it burns you and you suffer about it. Or you find jalapenos pleasant and you crave them and you're like, more please. Can I you know, upgrade to a habanero? And there's, you know, there's greed, this craving, this, I can't get enough. I've got to put hot sauce on everything find yourself with some habanero on your cheesecake and you're like, well, I'm going, <laughs> I might have a problem. <laughs> he says, you know, this human form that we're in is burning. You know, you can worship the fire, but actually if you turn your attention inward, you will see that you're on fire. You will see if you use, if you pay attention, you will see there's this burning craving for comfort, this burning hatred of discomfort, this uh, burning I, me, mine, self center, and even the burning of neutrality. Talking too much shit. <laughs> One of those Burning Man folks was like, we're shutting you down. <laughs> All right. I guess I got kicked off. I'm back. I think I'm back. And I like this 
burning because I just can relate to it. I imagine most of you, you know, sometimes we're and we even use the term like I was I was on fire. I was burning for, you know, like strong cravings. We talk about like uh, it, it was uh, the desire is like it was burning us up or hatred. Doesn't hatred just feel like do you get like I'm so hot. I was so angry. I got so hot at that situation at that. Um, and this wisdom that says we live in this body that all by itself, and there's no judgment here, you know, it's normalizing teaching. There's no, it's not like you are sinful. That's why you crave so much. It's just this normalizing teaching that says this human form all by itself craves. It's your survival instinct. It's not your fault. But you live with this eyes that are on fire with lust, ears that are on fire for love, you know, like, and it's so personal on some level. It's like, it's totally impersonal, not your fault, but your preferences, what, you know, like music or, or like taste, like spicy is a good example. Some of us find it pleasant. Some of us find it unpleasant. We could put on some music in here and there'd be so many different opinions about like, oh, that's really pleasant. I really, Slayer is so soothing <laughs> to my nervous system. And other people that would just be like fucking making my ears bleed, turn it off. Your perception of what's pleasant and what's unpleasant and what's neutral. Not like there is a, you know, kind of master, you should like this and you shouldn't like that. It's whatever you do like and don't like. It's very personal to your perception of sound, smell, taste, sensation, emotion, fear, uh, mind states. Some of us like to be afraid. That's like, that's the excite, you know, that's that line between I like shit that's kind of scary. I find it pleasant to be terrified. Some people are like, no, please, like, let me feel safe. I don't want to feel terrified. I want to feel comfortable and safe. And that's not pleasant at all. I hate that. I've been guilty of not being so aware of other people's preferences. I took um, my girlfriend's neighbor for a ride in my hot rod and I didn't realize that he has a lot of anxiety because he was really into it and he was checking it out. And he's like, yeah, he's like, and I just like was peeling out and he was like, ah, please don't do that. And I was, you know, just like my own self-centered is like, well, you like this, like, don't you want to like, be afraid like that's why you like this right like it's fun to be afraid like, we could die at any minute this is this is exciting this is exciting it's got a corvette motor and no brakes it's great it's amazing he didn't think so he wants to survive So everything's on fire and not only in us, but then you look at the world, look at social media, look at, turn on the news, walk down the street. Everything is burning with greed and hatred and delusion, this whole planet. And it's like, literally we've destroyed the ecosystem, the environment with human greed, right? So this isn't just, I wanna feel pleasant. I'll fucking cut down the rainforest out of, you know, I'll, I'll destroy the whole, I'll, I'll keep producing uh, gas powered blowers. <laughs> I had a conversation, I had a conversation earlier with a friend who was like, you know, gas powered blowers, you know, that blow the, the leaves, leaf blowers, like they're worse than cars because they're two strokes and they're destroying the environment oil and, all. and it's like it's true like but our human greed like we just keep going the whole planet is literally heating up with greed and hatred and delusion that comes through that's in each one of us and it's not them it's not like oh well those greedy 
people out there drive cars. He took those fucking leaf blower people. <laughs> it's, you know, all of us. On the wrong internet. All right, well, we're going to go with it. Um, so what's the solution? It's all on fire. Nirvana is the solution. This term nirvana, what, what our practice brings us to. Mindfulness, renunciation, changing our relationship to pleasure, learning to sit still and tolerate pain rather than hating it, becoming more tolerant, more merciful, more compassionate towards discomfort. Rather than clinging to pleasure, learning to let go, to appreciate the impermanent nature of all pleasure. The term nirvana actually means to extinguish or to cool. One of the ways that the three things that burn us. When you're in greed, which means any form of attachment is greed from this perspective. Any clinging is greed. You're trying to keep something that you can't keep because it's impermanent and it burns you. One of my teachers said, it's the rope burns. You're trying to cling, you know, like a tug of war and you're trying to hold on to something, but you're playing tug of war with the universe and the universe is going to win every single time. You'll never win, but it doesn't stop us from continuing to be like, that fucking hurts. <laughs> Ouch. But am I going to let go? Fuck no, I don't quit. <laughs> Not giving up on this. I, you know, might be able to. Nirvana. Um, Nibbana, the original Pali, uh, I'm told to this day, I don't know Indian language or culture that well, but that it's a cooking term that means to remove, like you've it's done cooking and it's time to cool, like when you're taking the souffle out of the oven and it's, you know, it's Nibbana, it's done cooking. It's done getting cooked, it's done getting burned, it doesn't need any more heat, it's finished. So the solution is, yes, our eyes are on fire with greed and hatred and delusion, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our bodies, our minds. But mindfulness is the extinguisher. Compassion is the extinguisher. Non-attachment is the extinguisher. Learning that it's not your fault, it's not that personal, but that through a disciplined renunciation of clinging, and it's not like we just can make the decision of like, I'm going to stop clinging because that hurts. It's wired into us to crave, to cling. Your ears, your mind, your body, all of us, it does it all by itself. But the more we turn towards it in meditation, long-term meditation training, the more we see, oh, I'm starting to accept pain a little bit more, meet it with a little more friendliness, a little more compassion. And it's cooling it. I'm not getting so burned by my relationship to pain. I'm starting to let go, to renounce um, some, some behaviors we renounce, renounce altogether, like drugs and alcohol. Part of Buddhism is to be sober because the false pleasure of intoxication is addictive and it's, and it's deluding. You're not able to practice non-attachment and compassion when you're high. You have to have a sober mind to do this. And even with a sober mind, as you know, not that easy, hard, long-term counter-instinctual rebellion against human nature is to suffer. To wake up is fucking radical endeavor, totally possible, well worth long-term effort, endeavor, but it's, in, you know, it's, it's a really... Uh, slow process, unfortunately.
friend Brandon is uh, at class uh, at home on Zoom and singer for uh, one of my favorite punk rock bands called Dr. No. And they have a song called Burn. And one of the, the core lines is, you will learn to watch it burn. And I feel like that is such a good mindfulness lyric because it's not where it's not we're going to stop our eyes from lusting and our ears from lusting and our tongue from lusting and our body from lusting, craving, greeting. But mindfulness, you watch your eye going like, I really want, I don't want to see that. <laughs> I want to see that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear something that I like, not something that I don't like. I don't want to smell that. For a while, I was doing these huge yoga festivals, uh, Wanderlust Yoga Festivals, where I was teaching meditation to thousands of people. And they're nice yoga people. And almost every time I would say, like, you know, part of our mindfulness is to increase our tolerance for discomfort, not just doing the yoga asana, but learning to sit still, learning to be uncomfortable, and then bringing that into our relationship to seeing and hearing and smelling. And say, so, you know, today out here at this festival, we have porta potties. And it's a wonderful opportunity <laughs> while you're in the porta potty to be with unpleasant smell and not suffer about it. Rather than going in there with, I hate this, this is disgusting, it's smell, it's unpleasant smell, and you can be mindful of it and use it as part of your practice, rather than the sort of yoga like, well, we only want to have bliss. No, go sit in the porta potty. <laughs> That's real enlightenment. Feeling good because you're chanting your kirtan and getting a head rush is not real enlightenment. It's just chasing more pleasant experiences. Kind of talking some shit tonight. Check out my new tattoo. Um, he got a fire extinguisher tattooed at, with the three jewels. He's like, I really got the teaching last week. <laughs> we are firefighters. That's what we're doing as bodhisattvas, as meditators, as Buddhists. We are here to extinguish from the inside out, to put out our greed, our hatred, our delusion that, you know, he's like, I got it where I'm on, you know, my eyes, my ears, it's burning. And this practice will help extinguish it. And then it's from the inside out. And that not only internally in our own life, but that we can start to help each other extinguish. We can start to be of service. We can start to be socially engaged, politically active. And, you know, in that kind of Chappelle renunciation of actually leaving shit on the table. You don't got to do everything just because you can. You don't got to take all of the, uh, you know, like, like the Buddha did was like, no, I'm not in it for the power and the prestige. I'm in it for freedom. And he set it up so that the Dharma was freely offered, not charged for, not monetized, not just like, you know, in, in my own half-assed way, it's what we're trying to do here at Against the Stream. Everyone's welcome. If you have money, you should donate to help support what we're doing. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. Freely offered. The Dharma is too precious to charge money for. If we charge money, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> It's worth way more than, you know, this shit that will transform our lives. Is, is, but so we just give it away. It's freely offered, just like in the lineage of the Buddha who said, we got to make this available to anyone who's interested with the understanding that very few people are going to be willing to do this, to really go inward to really take responsibility to, uh, for their own mind and, and to really have this radical change towards compassion, towards non-attachment. So the fire sermon for your contemplation, what are your 
questions, comments, clarifications about this. And I'm sorry at home, I was on the wrong Wi-Fi, so I got kicked off a couple of times. I don't know if there was a couple breaks in the Zoom stream, but I'm back. Any questions about anything about this talk or about anything else meditation, Buddhists based? If you're at home, you can raise your hand and then the, yeah, Jonathan, I see you, go for it. You know, thanks. I actually have been wanting to ask you this for a while and I suspect I might know your answer, but I gotta ask, right? There's a lot of like talk about like psychedelics in Buddhism and whether there's a place for it on the path of enlightenment. So I totally wanna hear your thoughts. Um, for some, sure. I'll say, I'll say, sure. There's a place for it. Um, it seemed to be very useful for, you know, the people, the, you know, that didn't have, you know, like in the sixties or whatever, like it was so useful for my father and Ramdas and those guys that kind of, you know, early trailblazers, it kind of woke them up to something. And then they, started a meditation practice. So I don't want to completely dismiss it as being, um, having been useful for some people. I talked to somebody recently that thought that they had some, you know, healing kind of things, you know, with some psychedelics. So I, um, you know, but also what I want to say, and what I really, you know, first wanted my, my first in, uh, uh, in reaction of what I wanted to say was that the Buddha didn't think so, you know, that the Buddha was quite clear, you know, like, I don't know how much, probably there wasn't ayahuasca, maybe there, there probably was some sort of mushroom psychedelics in, in his time. And, um, but clearly like this whole teaching of the fire sermon and these guys that are using uh, THC, CBD, whatever you want to call it, that they were smoking, um, you know, he was like, this is just a dead end. This is not going to be forward leading if what you want is freedom from suffering. You, and you need to train your mind. It's much more uh, reliable to get there with a sober mind than to have a uh, psychedelic experience, a deluded mind that reveals something that you're probably not going to be able to embody. So I will land in my first, which is sure for some, okay, mostly we should meditate our way to the freedom that we want to want to experience. Now it's different if we're talking about some of the psychedelic treatments for different mental illnesses. Um, I, mean, I don't want to kind of take that away from people who are actually benefiting from some of that stuff or like the study that they did with um, MDMA and, and psilocybin with uh, terminally ill patients. And they found that it really improved people's quality of end of life experience. So there's, there's certain situations where, you know, psychedelics are probably quite medicinal. When it comes to the spiritual path, um, my own sense is um, they're, they're a distraction. And then actually just meditating will reveal the truth to you. And that there's a piece of impatience uh, in most of the people that I've talked to that want a quick fix. And it's more craving. It's more second noble truth. I, want, I don't wanna do the work. I wanna take something that will do the work for me rather than sitting here with achy knees and a loud mind and developing wisdom and compassion towards my body my mind without some sort of altered state. I don't know if you've seen this book, Jonathan, um, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, and it's uh, Daniel Goleman and um, Richard Davidson, Richie da Richard Davidson. Uh, Daniel Goleman's the man who created emotional intelligence using sort of Buddhist principles, uh, emotional intelligence, did a bunch of books on emotional intelligence. And uh, Richard Davidson's one of the uh, neuroscience researchers that's been putting the meditators in the kind of CAT scans or whatever they're doing to measure the brain waves of meditators. Both of them are old psychedelic warrior cowboys, 60s guys. And they did a book called um, Altered Traits. And in that book, they talk about like, we were all looking for these altered states and we thought we could 
hallucinate our way to altered states. And then we thought we could meditate our way to altered states. And as our spiritual practice developed, we realized it's not about altered states. It's about altering our traits, developing compassion, developing wisdom, developing kindness, tolerance, forgiveness. That's the true awakening, not a hallucination, but, you know, um, not an altered state, an altered trait. So I thought that that was pretty brilliant, you know, coming from those, you know, psychedelic guys from the 60s who kind of did the meditative path later and, and continue to do it. Last thing I'll say about this, um, it's incredibly dangerous, you know, so much of our community are recovering addicts. And, um, you know, if you're not in recovery and you want to fuck around with some psychedelics, I mean, I might even go like to like, some people are so uptight, they need to take acid at least a couple times, <laughs> right? Like for sure, there are some people that like could really use it. Um, but if, you know, most of our community aren't that type, you know, we're the type, you know, um, I have a, a student who was trying to talk his um, sponsor into like some psychedelic, you know, letting him, you know, co-signing him do some psychedelics. And she said to him, she's like, you know, some people need to trip. You don't need to trip. You've tripped a hundred times. You don't ever need to do that again. Like, you need to be of service. You need to meditate. You need to heal. You don't need to keep escaping. You need to, you know. So it's hard to say, but I've heard too many stories of sober people that thought that going to do ayahuasca would be part of their spiritual practice and ended up relapsing and ended up dying uh, or being miserable and coming back into recovery. So uh, my sense is like, if you're a recovery person, it's not an option. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's not a wise thing to do most of the time. And again, like, I can't say a hundred percent of the time, if you, you know, eat some mushrooms, you're going to relapse. Or if you, you know, uh, do ayahuasca or lick the toad or, you know, whatever it is, you're going to relapse. But I've heard a bunch of you know, anecdotal student stories of people that it didn't work out well for. And I think for us, and especially Buddhists, you know, the Buddhist teaching was abstinence, including psychedelics as part of the, uh, the, the, the kind of sober, clear mind mindfulness. So I know I'm all over the place with my views and opinions about that, but hope that some of it, yeah, welcome. Moke. Yeah, is it possible, would it ever be possible to reach nirvana or a nirvana through meditation, or am I always be meditation, meditating next to a pile of burning shit? Um, yes, you will, you will reach as, you know, as far as you can get. Meditation is the solution, but it's meditation and renunciation. So you can't just keep doing whatever you want to do and meditate a lot and think like, okay, cool. Like um, I meditate two hours a day, but then I lie and steal and cheat and, you know, uh, engage in unethical behavior and wonder why, like, why am I still? So it's not just meditation. Renunciation is a huge part of it. The five precepts are the minimum level of renunciation for us. And that is a, a commitment to nonviolence and not killing, a commitment to, to rigorous honesty and not stealing, a, a commitment to avoiding sexual misconduct, being in full integrity in our relationships and our sexuality, and, and sobriety. And, you know, the, the fifth precept, which is total abstinence from drugs and alcohol. So renunciation and meditation will extinguish the pile of burning shit inside your heart. <laughs> Eventually. If you, you know, like if you really, if you really commit and you really do the practice and you really do the renunciation, it will take you there. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not enlightened, but um, I know from direct experience that 33 years ago when I started meditating, I couldn't sit still. 
and I could only feel a half a breath before my mind was wandering and I was still lying and stealing and fighting. And my first two years of meditation and recovery, I was fist fighting and I was stealing and I was meditating and I wasn't making much progress and I wonder why. And then when I stopped stealing and fighting and lying and, and I took meditation more seriously, my life started to improve and my suffering started to decrease and I started to heal and I started to forgive. And then, you know, a decade in, it got a little bit better and a decade in, it got a lot better. And so the renunciation is a big piece of it as well as the meditation. We can leave it there for tonight. You, um, you know, really reflect on this, see if it makes sense, but really uh, try, try to bring your mindfulness into seeing all of the times throughout your day where your eye is burning with aversion or with lust. See where your ears are burning with aversion or with craving, where your body is uncomfortable and it's burning with hatred towards that pain or your mind is stirred up and you, you see the burning and know that mindfulness, present time, non-judgment, just bringing awareness to it soothes it, naming it. Oh, this is craving. This is aversion. This is self-centered fear. Naming it, knowing it is part of the solution. And then we start to include, incline our reaction towards, can I meet this with compassion? Even if the answer is no in the beginning. And often in the beginning, you're like, I, I can't, I don't have any compassion yet. But if you keep trying, more tolerance, more mercy, more compassion. And over the years, you'll get better and better at it. And every time you find yourself burning with like, oh, wow, fucking rope burns. I'm really holding on to something that's impermanent and I'm suffering about it. What if I let go? What if I try to let go? And one of my favorite teachers, Arjun Sumedho, he said for the first two years of his meditation, he said, I couldn't feel my breath. I was all over the place. He said, so I just said in my mind over and over, let go, let go, let go, let go as a mantra, just trying to train his mind to stop clinging, let go. And so I offer that to you also as part of the extinguishing of that which is causing us suffering. Class is done by donation. And uh, there's a, a bowl at the desk there if you have cash that you'd like to donate. Uh, 15 to 20 dollars is suggested, but you can give whatever feels appropriate to you. Feel free to give more, feel free to give less. If you don't have cash and you'd like to Venmo, it's written on the desk there, or you can Venmo against the stream meditation. You can do that. Um, those are kind of our two ways right now. I don't have, I'm not set up with the card reader at the moment to take uh, swipes. Um, you can also just go to the website and uh, donate through the website against the stream.com. Uh, the link to the donations is in the chat here on Zoom. Well, many thing coming up to announce. I'll be starting a new like three or four month study course, probably in January. We will, you know, I'm just, I've got another, I've got one that's finishing in December. Um, I'll do a New Year's Eve thing. I'll do a New Year's Eve intention setting ceremony. Um, I think New Year's Eve is Friday this year. And we have a AA meeting in here on Friday uh, from uh, 7.30 to 8.30. So I'll probably do it later. I'll probably do like a, um, like a nine or like nine or nine thirty to midnight on New Year's, and we'll kind of do a, a meditation and intention setting ceremony. So that will be coming up. I might have to actually, I don't know. Last year we had a hundred people in here, and it's a little too tight, especially with COVID. So I got to do some thinking on that, um, how to how to do it and not overload it. I don't like to turn people away, but we might need to do tickets or something this year. It's believed that our meditation practice and our discussion of the Buddhist teachings, the Dharma, 
have a positive effect on the planet. May we share this blessing, this merit outward in all directions. May each one of us extinguish to whatever extent we can in this lifetime our own suffering. And together, may we extinguish as much suffering in the world as we can. Thank you for your practice, your consideration of these teachings, your generosity, and uh, see you next time.